Good evening from India. My name is Raj Kumar. I'm the Vice Chancellor of OP Jindal Global University. Good morning to my friends in North America and Canada. Good afternoon to our friends in Europe. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to the second day of the Global Virtual Conference on Reimagining and Transforming the Future of Law Schools and Legal Education. We are at the 18th thematic session on the theme, Potentialities of the Pandemic, Industry, Professional, and Academic Collaborations. We have a very distinguished uh, group of individuals who are leaders in their own right, who have contributed to many aspects of innovation and transformation in their respective walks of life. We have with us Professor Ildiko Zegdi Mazak, Head International Relations Law School, uh, Pontifica Universidad Yavarna in Colombia. We have Professor Amnon Lahavi, Dean of the Harry uh, Radzner School of Law Interdisciplinary Center, Herzliya from Israel. We have Professor Jayant Krishnan, uh, Milt and Judy Stewart, Professor of Law, Indiana University, Bloomington from United States. We have with us Mr. Nishit Desai, founder of the Nishit Desai Associates. And lastly, not least, Honorable Mr. Justice Matthew Cooper, Judge of the Supreme Court of New York, United States. I'm very delighted that my good colleague, Professor Erickson Gudmunder, professor at Jindal Global Law School, OP Jindal Global University, will be moderating this panel. I request Professor Gudmunder to take this forward and I'll join you shortly. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody, near and far. <clears throat> well, I think, uh, I think everyone uh, prefaces conversations nearly wherever we are in, in lobbies or in, uh, in virtual sessions like this by saying, if there's anything we have learned from the COVID, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I would like on the basis of what we're discussing here to identify two things. The first is of course, the need for collaboration. Now this is not a new lesson for any of us. We all know how important this is in our academic environment. Uh, Jay, you just mentioned the, the cooperation you have between your uh, academic institute and, and the Nish's uh, law office. And uh, we all know, for instance, in, um, in Jindal, we pride ourselves on having 200 plus cooperation with other universities and other institutes abroad. But what we have learned, I think, quite clearly, is the immediacy of this type of collaboration. Now, uh, we've seen this in the, um, very casually in the, in the fields which matter a lot in the field of health, uh, and medical improvements and innovations. But, so, but uh, it's no less important in, in the law. And where are we in the law? We all know that the law moves rather slowly. You might say this is a rather ponderous uh, discipline. Well, we have learned that we have to move quickly in all these fields. And not only the quickly for what we're, uh, what we're uh, discussing today, or the present, the present situation, but in the future. And I think we've, uh, we'll give a little time at the end for each of us to speculate on what the future brings, whether we see some uh, sustainability and what the lessons that we learn here. Um, I was thinking, we're th thinking in terms of three, three themes. First of all, uh, because we're in the academic environment, it's very important to our students to know the effects of the, how to, how to react um, to the, the COVID as far as their, well, the, their studies are concerned and then their future and then the link between that is the, the internships that they would have uh, with uh, practitioners. And uh, if I mentioned, ask you, Matt, also how that's going with respect to the interns in, in, in your court. Uh, secondly, what does it, what this, what this leads to the prospects, what this means for the prospects of the, our, our students in the immediate future, the, new, uh, the soon to graduate, the seniors that are with us, what is, what is their immediate future? How can they adjust to this? How can we help them through collaboration adjust to these concerns? And then finally, and I know this is directed to our, our, our academic colleagues, research. What have we learned about how we conduct research? Are we doing it as effectively? Have we adjusted to the situation? These are the three things that I want to um, explore. And in the course of our discussion, I would like each of you to kind of give a personal reflection on how you are reacting to the COVID in your, in your daily lives and particularly in your professional lives. Well, I, I'll begin on that myself uh, before I ask specific questions to each of you. Um, I, I'm 
uh, addressing this on two fronts. First of all, as a, as a professor, uh, we've now had nearly a year uh, of experience in this. And yes, we have been able to adopt. We fortunately, I'm happy to see uh, our IT people are with us today. They made an excellent job uh, for all of us. There's been a lot of collaboration required. I, have, I do two courses and I have a 12 man team backing me up academically, research assistants, teaching assistants, co-teachers. This is necessary. Uh, we, we have nearly a, a one to five ratio of uh, staff to, to the students. What, is, what, what I found is counterintuitively is that this method, this, this uh, process of uh, education is in many ways more intimate than the classroom situation. Not necessarily for good reasons, because we have to adapt to individual circumstances people are facing in their families, some rather tragic, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but it's much more like tutoring, in fact, in, in, the, in the, the context that we have with our students. As I said, it's not like a mass of 30 or 40 students in the classroom treating them as a unit. It's much more personal. This is, I say, counterintuitive. But secondly, I'm also serving on a court which has judges from five different countries located in four different continents. And one, 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 of, one of the things I've found, and I, I'd like you to share your views on this, uh, the collaboration necessary between us, the physical collaboration is, is, is very difficult. And we've not yet, in my case, found a way to deal with this. Um, and now I'm talking, not talking about the paper practice part of the law, where people present their, 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 um, their claims and counterclaims, and we can deal with them uh, in our chambers. But then when it comes to deliberations, and particularly a very sensitive, politically sensitive case, such as the one that we're dealing with, we will find it difficult to enter into the type of uh, deliberations which are necessary. And here we got, this comes back to the, our starting point in a way, what have we lost by not being able to sit in, in rooms together, uh, share coffee, not virtually, but with uh, pouring each other coffee, talking about things other than the strict confinement of the, of the which is caused by the, the medium that in which we're communicating. So these are my, my, my thoughts and my own experiences. And please, uh, each of you uh, add, to, add, to, add to this, uh, this general, general discussion also, but, but, but let me put it, you, please come in uh, uh, to deal with these general things, but we have some specific questions which you've been asked to, uh, um, we've been asked to ask. And I, I would ask, first of all, about um, Nishit, perhaps you could tell us what, what the situation is now with internships, which is a very important part of our, our education. Yes, a uh, very good question. What happened actually for us, uh, and I can share my experience, and that is almost about 15 years ago, we started what is called wall interns program. Because when we were small, we could not accommodate many interns, but our desire was to help everyone from whichever part of the world, you know, want to learn something. So uh, as it is when I wrote paper setting up my firm in 1990, and at that point of time, I had talked about virtual organization and our desire to go virtual, uh, that was in 91. And um, uh, so, you know, we were always on that, that we want to be a nano firm. So stay small, think big, do big, using technology and law and tax as a tool or as tools to change the world for the better together and physical constraints will not come because when I started law firm, you know, obviously you're competing with 100 year law firms, you learn a lot from them, but you are physically constrained. So we started wall intern program almost 15 years ago. So we have lots of wall interns. So physical constraint did not come now. Uh, second thing that we tried to do and which is where we need some help from all of you and that is to create wall mentorship. So, you know, we can collaborate by creating, and we have that program, Wall Mentor, and, uh, you know, we have to some contribute and whatever it is. So, you know, if we can create that collaborative world, we can create excellent virtual internship program. I think it works extremely well. And um, uh, interestingly, we also have certain software for bandwidth management created by ourselves. So whenever somebody is free, you can do internship, even while you're attending your college, 
you can still do internship because it is not that you have to physically come. And uh, uh, I was always talking that it will be easier to go virtual, but pandemic forced us to do that. So now we are fully virtual and offices are at the moment decorative pieces sitting, hopefully in the next few months. Uh, COVID, uh, some uh, uh, vaccine will come and next uh, by May, June, we should be at least 50% working. So I think, but I think this should not come in the way. It has taught a lot of lessons. I don't want to take too much, but uh, there are ways to continue to educate the uh, students. And uh, I'll talk separately about client continuing education program that we also have conducted and this is different experience. But there also students can help us uh, to put together program. So this is my- I, 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 Again, I, I'm thinking about myself. I, I, I can only speak from my own experience as the, the purveyor. I, 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 we haven't really had the reaction from the students. But in your case, of course, the thing that they most stu students um, or interns learn most during their education with people like yourself is to be able to see you in action and and communicate yeah. with you the same kind of, they, they lose this of course well what we find is that today this virtual uh, uh, experience is giving one-on-one -on -one experience to us today you're talking i feel you're talking to me but you're talking to thousands of other people simultaneously on one on one we find this to be more effective yes you what you miss is nice coffee a smell and personal interaction, touch and feel, and whatever you call it. But I think in, if we put out of 100, uh, about 90 percent, we think we'll, we are in a better shape. Next few years, we'll have AR, VR, with a lot more technology. Instead of universe, we'll be begin to talk about metaverse, you know, and that whole thing will change the complexion of the life. And I believe we'll have a lot more, uh, you know, uh, experience to enjoy, hopefully. Yes, we will find some way to be you know, uh, that's that element, yeah. I think that's, uh, that was my take next five, 10 years. Matt, how about you? How is, how is this uh, reflected in, in, the, in your interns or your clerks? You know, I guess my first reaction is what, when I think about that we did one of these seminars, I did this one of these seminars with Raj back uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, this seems so novel. This was like the most, we spent half the time wondering and, and uh, sit, sitting there and extolling the virtues of technology that we can actually do this. Now it seems rather mundane. We've all gotten fairly used to doing things virtually. When uh, the pandemic hit, that summer I was looking forward to having a whole slew of interns. Three of them were going to become from OP Jindal. I'd been over at Jindal in March, interviewed three really excellent people. and they would have been joining three other interns from uh, New York State, uh, New York, uh, from United States law schools. The problem, that never happened in terms of the Jindal students. Because the, really part, I think, of the experience for law students from India would be to actually come to the United States, come to New York, spend time in New York City, get to know this, not only know the courts, but know the society in which those courts operate. And I had so looked forward to introducing the students to life in that crazy big New York City that never took place. Regrettably, hopefully, things might change that we could do it this year. But we had three students from various law schools in two in the New York City area, one from Hawaii, and we decided to move forward on the internship over the summer. And I have to say, it worked better than I thought. The lack, uh, I do two different things. I sit both in an appeals court and I sit in a trial court. And my trial court is a very, very hands-on court. It's a matrimonial part. So I'm dealing with people who are divorcing. And a lot of the experience is just being in the courtroom, being in the robing room, being in the conference rooms, having seeing what actually goes on. It's not, Appeals court, of course, a little different. We're dealing with uh, a little more, much more static. I was at, skeptical at first that I would be able to come up with a way to bring our three law, uh, law students into the fold, but we managed with uh, Skype. And I think now we, in the court system, we have Microsoft Teams. They were able to participate in the conferences. And as I learned to do this, and believe me, this has been a slow, uh, difficult process, 
This is what I grew up with, but I've learned. They were able to be part of it, part of this process. And I think I, they were able to, and let's say, for example, if we had a case being argued or even being set, let's say I had a, a settlement conference doing it virtually, which we make, we've made a great progress in doing that. I would have the interns also come in on the, on the, uh, <clears throat> on the Zoom call and they were able to play a role. They were able to do research. I would give them, if somebody came up in the midst of an argument, I could then have them submit uh, memos. It was good as it gets, better than I thought, thought it would be. Big problem, <clears throat> and I think, uh, you know, I think Nassi thought, uh, reference this, you sort of lack the, it, you lack the everyday experience. The in, uh, with mass, not any, the spontaneity. If something happens in the courtroom, something because that's what often would happen, or the case came in at the last minute, they would be part of this whole process. But now it has to be structured when they got to come in on the call. And I think the biggest down the the, the deficit for the interns is they don't have the exposure to the routine. The experience of every day being in my courtroom, being with other court clerks, being with the litig being with the lawyers. So that's the part that's lacking. But to the extent possible, we've been able to, we were able to at least come up with it, if not a perfect facsimile, a reasonable facsimile. Mm -hmm. So this year I'm looking forward to having if uh, the the things being hopefully uh, hopefully things won't be this way but if we're still in a semi lockdown or semi new way of doing business come this summer I look forward to having interns from uh, all over and hopefully people in person if we can't have people in person at least come up with a virtual internship mm -hmm. biggest problem I think for one of the there was two three of my interns or two of my interns were from the New York area I said one was from Hawaii that was the biggest problem for him whenever he was going to be spending the summer in New York. So instead, whenever we had a conference at, you know, at, at 10 o'clock or a case on 11 o'clock, he had to get up in three in the morning to, part, yeah, to, yeah. to participate. He was allowed to, I said, since he was allowed to keep his microphone, his, uh, his uh, video off and come in his pajamas. Yeah. Well, I had that. We have, we have a five and a half hour difference in my case. And I used to teach at 10 o'clock a very good, good time to teach in India, but it's, it's not so good that we have to wake up at 4.30 to do it. But, but I, Jay, I want to come to you in just a minute to, about, about the research element. But before that, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Ildika and, and, and uh, uh, Amnon about this, what we just heard from Matt, this, um, what we actually lack is the cohort uh, experience. You'll find many, many people, that are, students that have, I've recommended uh, for graduate work, they decided not to go because they won't get that cohort experience. They won't get it from an online learning. What, 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 what is your experience? Uh, if I ask first Ildiko about that. As we are structuring these uh, experiences at Haveriana University, uh, most of the time the, uh, the people in the offices, in the, at the law firms, or it can be also the superintendency or the courts, uh, that our students are going to do the internship. Uh, many of these people, the people actually, the persons, they are also our professors at the university. So um, um, we were very much keen on um, working together with these people who are at the same time professors of ours, that, that they are going to make even more connection in between what is actually going on in the classes and what is, act and, and what is going on in the professional training. Uh, obviously, the two things, they are different, but... but but actually, that, that was a good experience that, that you, you make sure that, that although there are like, like important differences, but, but the, the, what we try to do is, as we see in the professional training, is, is working on abilities. And uh, well, we have to do it from the law school. We have to do it from the cathedra, from the seminar. We also have to, have to work in abilities. And abilities, they are much more than being able to draft a text. This is, this is much more communicational abilities, analytical abilities. So, we, so what, what, what I can see in this situation is that, and we were working a lot 
with our departments, with the, with the dean, and, and, and also on the university level. We were working a lot on how to restructure the way how we are teaching, how we are teaching in the law school. And what we are doing is trying to, to back off from the theory and, and, and more readings and more readings and, and to be us much more practical, which means that eventually it can be an advantage because we are more working together with these professional trainings than actually how we were doing it before. And, um, and the other thing, um, I, we, we take more attention to the emotional development of the students. Yes. Well, obviously, as, as we are Jesuit education, this integral part of the education, mm -hmm. the, the emotional development, and, 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 and I just would like to say that uh, as sometimes we receive, we receive students, they are 16 year old, one, six, when they start the university. They, they, I mean, uh, I, I don't want to be irrespect, irrespectful to say babies, but my girl is almost 15 and, and I see her as a baby. And actually she has got like still four more years in school. That, that part with all these differences in, in public and private schools and, and stuff like that. But I mean, as, so as this emotional part and, 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 this, and, and this individual development of the student, we, we were always very much keen on working on it. But with the, with the, with the, with the, with the situation of COVID, we, we went in much more in that aspect actually. And, um, and, and this is a crisis. Yeah. We, 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 we reacting to, we re, reacting to crisis. We, we, we get into a different mode. Like you said, we, we very, we, we, we lack, latch onto the psychological. We don't usually think about that for our students, except unless it's obvious trouble people. And there are people that do that, we say. But I think every individual teacher now has, is aware of that and reacts. But just yeah, but one, other, one other point I want to ask you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. about yeah. the relations with the professors, because everyone, and I'm not talking about graduate students more, you know, doing the LLM or that they, do they get, do they feel that they're being deprived of the networking with the professors? Well, you're absolutely right. That's a problem. The, um, you come into our law schools. I mean, this level of law schools in the United States or in Colombia or wherever, or in, in India and wherever we are sitting and you are looking into, which is networking. Um, professors, they are, I mean, we are, we are telling them, and, and, and I am at the Department of, of Economic Law. So, uh, so we have, there we do have many, many of these huge law firm, uh, practitioner professors also teaching at the university. And uh, we very much ask them to, to, to be there for the students, for their professional needs and these professional needs of trying to get a job, a placement. This is very like on a personal base, how the university is working. And, uh, and because there was all, always this, this like, like very like strong networking between, between professors and students. But now, now what we need is that the professor is reaching out to the student, the professor professional from the law firm, reaching out to the student. Because, because these students, they can be, they can be like, um, it's a different after school to go up to the professor, professor, I just like to, would you, would you consider my CV? That, that's a very, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's the, the, for the students to do it vir virtually is much more difficult. So we are asking the professors to reach out to the students to help them because this is one of the most important uh, uh, feeling, which is actually creating even depression yeah. for the students where I am going to be placed. What am I going to do? Hmm? Yeah. Well, thank you for this, because I, I tell you something, I'm taking a note of this from my next class. I'm going to say the very same thing that I say it very generally, but I, I'm going to make it very specific tomorrow. I'm going to say exactly what you just said. You may have trouble reaching out. I want you to, I want you to consider, you know, that, that I am with, we are with, we are in the same, we're in the same boat as it were. I'm going to say this very, the, the very same thing you just told me. And Nitish will come back to that when, Nitish will come back to that when, again, we go from the link from school to the work environment. But first, Anna, could you share your experiences on how, what this has meant, that online teaching has meant to the camaraderie that students would otherwise be enjoying? Well, hello, good Madur. It's good to be here. Uh, well, definitely it has an adverse uh, impact. 
And you know, we live in a very interesting natural experiment. And interestingly, before the pandemic, many people talked about how physical universities are becoming obsolete, that the future universities will be e-universities or maybe we wouldn't need universities at all. And we all witness now how this simplistic assumption was wrong, how much both students and faculty miss the physical component of a physical university, a physical campus, and the, uh, and the social get together and the social meeting between people. So, so obviously on one level, you have those young people who want to come to the university to be part of a community, to network, to engage with each other, and obviously they miss out on this. But also on the pedagogic level, I think that getting together physically means something for the learning process. And I think that you feel this not so much on the theoretical classes. So if I teach property law, I can pretty much do it using the Zoom and using the PowerPoint and using the breakout room. So the theoretical classes, we pretty much know how to get things done, even you know in the face of the pandemic. But it's really the workshops. It's really the legal aid clinics. It's the practicums where students really miss out on a tremendous experience. And so when you are in a legal aid clinic, and we have 14 legal aid clinics in our law school, it's not only about just talking to a person, but it's talking to a person whom you meet in a certain place. If you want to understand how and why a certain person is disenfranchised, how and why he or she is in legal trouble, then you really need to get a sense of place, whether you do it inside the campus or you actually meet him or her outside of the campus. So I think that we've all come to learn that technology is great and technology can get a lot of things done for us in academia and legal academia in particular, but some elements of getting together, being in a physical campus, speaking to people just, you know, not through computers, but just on the eye level is essential also for the learning process and not only for the social yeah. dimension of learning. Yeah. So I think that, of course, that of course could <clears throat> apply across the board. This lack of, uh, con lack of contact does affect a lot of fields. But I, I think that you, you, you've isolated one of them, which is very important in our business. But Jay, as I said, I want you to speak about the research element. I know you are very much a hands-on researcher uh, Jay, mm -hmm. it must affect you more than many of your colleagues. Well, thank you. First, Goodwinder, for moderating this. It's wonderful to see uh, my friend Nishit, who I haven't talked to in a long time, uh, to be part of this and to meet three new friends as well. So I, I really appreciate this opportunity, and I want to thank the Vice Chancellor for, for organizing this session. Uh, so, good wonder you're right, and actually just to pick up on what the Dean said in his previous comment, I think the, to me, this issue uh, really dovetails that he was raising with what we're thinking about on the research side. So I, I view it in a way, Goodmunder, as a type of continuum. I mean, for researchers who are interested in doing what we might refer to as, you know, the, what I'll call the haves research, the, the research where we're looking at talking to elites and using um, technology to have you know, group interviews or interviews with people who have the ability to access uh, AV type technological devices, you know, th that type of research I think will be able to continue. So if I want to uh, look at what public interest lawyers are doing in Israel or what judges are thinking about in places like Colombia, um, you know, presumably they will have the ability to get onto a Zoom uh, call and I can ask um, my questions and do my field work virtually in that sense. So I think, you know, that will continue. And in fact, I was just advising one of my doctoral students yesterday, uh, who is, uh, he's a Saudi doctoral student and he's doing his field work in uh, Riyadh. And he is right now in New York City um, but he's going to be doing interviews with judges, lawyers, policymakers uh, in Saudi Arabia over the next three weeks. And everybody has Zoom. And that's going to be, he's going to be able to continue that. So that's going to be possible. So that field work 
we'll be able to continue. I think then if we sort of move on the continuum and think about people who are doing archival research. So if you're doing archival research and the archives that you're um, you know, interested in delving into, they have you know, made their resources uh, electronically available and you're able to communicate with the librarians and the reference uh, specialists. Um, you're going to be able to, you know, for the most part, maybe not get all of the documents you need, but you'll be able to get a lot. And we've seen that. Um, so, so that's what I would say is sort of the haves research. The people with, who have the, the ability and the resources um, to access this type of technology and the people that they're seeking to access it from, if they have this type of technology, great. I think that research can continue. Um, what concerns me is something that the Dean was mentioning earlier as it relates to uh, the, the have-nots. And what do we do uh, about trying to study people? I mean, so a lot of my own work, for example, has been on you know, looking at the, the people who struggle, um, particularly in communities where there is no internet and where there are no computers and where there is no access to this type of technology that we need. And so you have to actually get into the field and you actually have to spend time learning uh, about the experiences that these individuals um, are encountering on a daily basis. What do we say uh, about researchers who are interested in, in that line of inquiry? That concerns me. I mean, that, that worries me. And, you know, I have doctoral students right now um, who have won fellowships to go and study in Latin America and in South Asia, whose uh, field work has been put on hold. Um, and why? Well, they're interested in looking at women's rights in um, places like Mexico City, um, in particular, the villages that uh, are outside of Mexico City. I have a, a student in, who's, a, who's a wonderful doctoral student. She's both a lawyer and pursuing her PhD. And she's looking at NGO politics in rural India. Um, how does she do that type of research now uh, when the respondents she's seeking to collect data from simply, you know, forget about computers, forget about internet. They don't have many of the basic types of necessities that she's, um, you know, needing to get access to if she wants to connect with them. So, the, that type of research I worry about is being put on hold now. And, um, and, and you know, it's, it's like with the, a lot of what we're seeing over the last eight, nine months. I mean, we're seeing the, the disparities between the haves and the have-nots really accentuated um, in this moment. And, you know, as somebody who cares about access to justice issues, that's really, that's worrying. And that's yeah. very worrying. And so... Um, I think I'll stop there, but I mean, that, that's, that's, that's what well, I'm... Listen, by the way, um, if any of you want to jump in when, uh, when, when a, one, one of our colleagues is saying something which you can contribute to, please do so. But I want to come back to you, Nishit, about the next stage, the relationship between the, the, um, well, the industry, in, in our case, the law firms and the students, the, new, the, the newly or soon to graduate students. What, is, what are their prospects? Is there a whole new life? expected for them. And before I ask you to answer, uh, one of the things that, that of course we found, uh, Matt was talking about this routine business of, uh, of communicating. Not everybody can, not everybody can do this. And uh, whether there's a certain selectivity comes in, we know in the, in the legal field, uh, some of our senior colleagues are just not prepared to do this kind of thing. Of course, Nishith, you'll be, you're, you're forever young. You started this 20 years ago, way ahead of all of us. But maybe you could speak not only for yourself, but for the profession as a whole. I was resource starved. So when you, you know, less resources will become innovative. So if I wanted to accommodate more people, I had no physical space those days, right? And that's the beauty of the thing uh, anyway. So uh, if I could just react to a few things that have come up and how I look at things uh, unfolding. What you do in the classroom, we'll all become virtual. So there's something of law and practice of law. Okay, that, and uh, instead of two, earlier it was you sit in the classroom, you learn, then you do internship and you work with professional firm. Now there's going to be third element, and that is the evolvance or emergence of uh, 
uh, uh, the augmented and virtual reality and mixed reality. So you will be able to learn like a classroom through virtual thing. The AR VR is going to be very useful because that will give you a real experience of a courtroom scene what happens and you as if you are walking into seeing you know and that experience is going to improve so you won't get that much okay and uh, three the practical aspect it is like for example you want to learn swimming or you want to learn scuba diving you will be able to do all the preliminary work sitting in your room but then you have to actually go and dive in the ocean in the middle of an ocean and that's what is real experience so we will have to completely repurpose our universities Today it is very structured that people go to classroom, sit there, when there's coffee time, you go out, etc. If it's winter, you just don't go out, you know. So, uh, you know, so my feel is that we'll have to rethink how, what do we do with large campuses and what do we do, you know. Maybe where you need practical experience, where you need to come together and have touch and feel. So those modular programs will have to be developed. So, for example, you have... The, uh, nine months uh, uh, education program, four to five, six months will be like virtual. Maybe one month people can go to university and university will cater to not one particular class, but people from world over from time to time, like, you know, hotel would have different events or something like that. So you have two months or one month or 15 days or three days program in which you will deliver a lot more value bringing people together on a thematic basis or no agenda or meeting people, greeting, understanding the culture and all that. The whole purpose is to learn and experience each other's culture and views and thoughts and opening of the mindset. So we believe, and that's what we believe, the next evolution that we together should be doing, how do we change the world for the better together? So, you know, that is where universities would come. The role of uh, the traditional role of just teaching in the classroom will all become obsolete. It will become as through Zoom or WebEx or whatever you call it. Uh, number two, that we have seen and experienced this AR, VR quite a bit in our own campus, which we have built in Mumbai now, as you all know. Um, and there we have used Internet of Things. So if you want to learn about a tree, you can go near the tree and just put your cam uh, phone camera and you have all the biology. What I, I don't know what this tree is about. You know, it will tell me everything. Just as I take a picture, it will tell me everything about, you know, if you want to learn about currency note and you see why this picture is there and what does it mean, it will tell you everything. So I think the moment we get into that space, augmented or virtual reality or AR, VR, mixed reality, that is going to give live experience. But it will be still virtual experience, okay? And <clears throat> you're really going, you're going, uh, repurposing of university. I'm saying learn. you're going way, way ahead of us. I must say, I'm, I'm, I rather lament this situation that at, at a certain time our, ba our brains will, be, we, we no longer take anything in here. It'll all be in our hands, and um, no, no longer yeah. necessary to need anything. We just push a button, and the information will be purveyed to us. We have not entered the era of quantum computing. Mm -hmm. That let us bear in mind. And whole, that is why there is another uh, di uh, uh, dilemma, or I would say debate, as to where will this end? Like Google will go into your mind. You don't need anything. You know, you want an answer. You have a chip in the body, and you want to answer anything. Okay, it can immediately tell you that this is the answer to a question. Okay, so today it's all we surf on the Google and do all those kind of things. But now we will have a chip in the body which will react to everything. So as technology moves, We'll have to get into new reality and sometimes we are scared of it as it might be happened 50 years ago. But today we are seeing there are benefits to that. But most important thing I think universities need to do, how, who is going to drive the driverless, as they call it, you know. So this new technology, we have to really anticipate what will be the future <coughs> sociological, political, economic or uh, psychological problems and where is the limit to what can you do with the technology because double-edged sword i think the most important thing to do is what is the limit to what how do we manage the downside of technology today we are very excited but it can really create a havoc i, data, I think i've already, I think I've already indicated one of the downsides that we may we may uh, no longer have to think which is one of our main purposes and then you begin to wonder if i really want to be cataclysmic do we or do we do we really have to be here at all <clears throat> 
the na nature would not suffer from our absence. But, uh, but, but Matt, I want to come back to what we were saying before, because you dealt earlier with the relationship with the interns. What about the relationships with, with your colleagues on the bench? How are you able to communicate? I mean, the deliberations that I'm describing. I can only share my experience. Yeah, For example, what we have done is that every week, uh, we found there is a McKinsey article for the best meeting. They said maximum six to eight people. You really do best brainstorming best. If you're bigger than that, then it slowly gets tapering off, right? So what we do on a weekly basis, we have this meetings of six people to eight people maximum. And in that put uh, things one on one basis, I'm able to talk to everybody. Even interns are able to talk to me. Otherwise, they will have to. Uh, of course, we didn't have so much of hierarchy, but other doorkeepers are there. You meet, you set, find a time. Ninety nine percent of the interns never saw who the founder is, right? But today I'm able to talk on one on one basis and experience mm -hmm. has been very good. Yes, we are just, as you say, trying to see how do we not miss the real life experience for the people. Yeah. You know, I, well, I just, maybe, maybe what you're, what you're suggesting. We had one intern from rural area and he wrote most of the paper on globalization. I could never believe that this came from a very small town called Rati or some uh, from very small place. I thought he is a, a, some top university student or something like that. Then he, we invited him to do physical internship. And one day he came and told me, sir, I've never seen an ocean in my life. He wrote papers on globalization. Can I take a leave to just go and experience the ocean? That is where the real you know, thing comes in what you mentioned that. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad yeah. we have that still. But, 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 yeah. but I'm thinking now, uh, in your in your in your experience, you're speaking amongst colleagues in a way, and I'm thinking more like um, in a, in a, a kind of adversarial uh, situation, uh, which happens in the in the in the in the deliberations in the courtroom. Um, it's not like I mean, in many ways, we're a group working together. But on the other hand, we have these uh, these uh, differing ideas which we have to exchange. How does that work for you, Matt? In the you know, so, uh, good morning. I was thinking about one thing that struck me when Dean Amnon spoke, when he spoke about the intangibles this, the, of not being in a physical university, that there's something lacking. And I also think about when Jane was talking about the problems with access to justice. And what struck me, my life up until, and to some extent still continues because we are going into the courthouse periodically is that my life took place in a civic temple, a temple of justice. This is 60 Center Street. You may have seen it when you see Law and Order. It's the, they walk up the steps and they're the big Doric columns. And it says across the pediment, uh, the fair administration of the fair administration of justice is the firmest, is the firmest pillar of government. It is so that's where things took place with people actually in the courthouse. So people who don't have access to the internet, people who are people who aren't in the elites could always look to go to a physical place, the courthouse to seek justice. And the same way there's a sort of way that Amnon was talking about that synergy that takes place when people are together in a, a building, in a physical structure. That's what I see taking place in courthouses. And we may be lack, that may be something of the past. That's what I'm afraid of. We are moving towards a, there are lots of virtues of this virtual system. Let's face it. People don't have to sit in courts for hours and hours for the case to be called doing nothing, just sitting there reading the paper or looking at their briefs. They can be doing other work and then they can come on a, a set time. There's not the same, they don't have to devote time to travel. But what I'm afraid of is that lack of sort of the social intercourse, the social connection that takes place, the synergy that takes place in a courtroom and in a, a, a real courtroom and in a actual structural courthouse. And I think, uh, good mother, you had talked about my relation with colleagues. It's different. We really be lacking that that social network we had. Yes, we can talk to each other virtually. And again, we are coming into the courthouse, but we're doing everything virtually from the courthouse. But it looks like that's going to change. So now that we're having a second wave in New York. And there's a sort of up there is what I hear from my colleagues 
there's a definite form of alienation that is set in a sort of a despondency that we're la we're lacking that that intimacy that we had, and that I think is one of the as we see uh, when Nishleth was talking about this brave new world of moving forward, and some of these things are just amazing that we can do technologically. The nagging thought I have is what is going to have what's going to happen to that intimacy, that collectivity we would have all of us together in a place doing, trying to deliver justice. Mm -hmm. Will that endure? I'm concerned about that. I, well, I, I, can, I agree with you. We occasionally Mike. joke about that we're all going to be, have all the judges will be in call centers taking calls. We don't need to be in courthouses anymore. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a somewhat, uh, that's, we can joke about it, but it's not all that unrealistic. Well, I don't know if Raj can hear us. Last uh, two weeks, three weeks ago, Judge Yusuf, the president of the ICJ, he spoke about the majesty of the court. You certainly, we certainly lose that. Uh, you, you don't come into the, like in your case, in, in lower Manhattan or in, uh, in the Hague. You lose that, the, the majesty of the, of the process. And, and that's a part of our business. We all, we all know that the law is, is mystique. We, and many of us try to keep it that way. And, and, uh, but, um, uh, certainly, we, we lack that. And the, the thing that I mentioned that I agree with you also when you speak about the esprit de corps, you know, when you're working together as a, as a group, not individuals as one, as a, you know, one to one or even one in one place and one in another. Well, uh, Ildiko, can you, can you come in about now you're in a part of the world many of us never go to, though by, I should point out that I, I used to be ambassador to your country. So I have, I have been to Bogota. But um, you, you, you must find some of the advantages by being able to bring in people from all over the world much more easier uh, than you used to, to have conferences. Um, we really took advantage of, of, this, uh, of this possibility of, of, of connecting in and, and, um, and um, there are, I mean, in the, in the last couple of years, as, as you saw yourself, is there are so many people who they want to come in. Uh, I don't like to become like a this peace laboratory because I don't feel like a rat or something like of that nature. Uh, but in a, in general, I mean, we need to take the we need to take advantage of the people they are interested in 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 studying whatever is going on in in Colombia. Um, but what I would like to talk about is is actually something what I see among my students. Um, my students, Colombian students, as they themselves they become somehow in the last couple of years, and this, is, and this is just enhancing with the COVID, much more aware of the social problems of the country. So that's actually for me, this, this is huge question, how more and more students as a professional career, they are choosing to go into working with NGOs or working or starting their own very specialized they are, they are law firms, but, but what they say is, actually, somehow I am going to finance it, but I, I want to move into working with the people, helping the people. So um, how this whole social awareness, which, which actually started many years ago, but it got enhanced in the last couple of years, is it going to be, is it going to be interrupted? Because this is going really to work with the people to help really, I mean, and this is not like sending out Facebook is like, oh, I love people, I love humanity. No, this is going down, not going down. This is actually going up because this is to work with the people who are really in necessity, how we can do it. And actually I was very much afraid how that could be. And when I look at young colleagues and I look at the students, they really do it. And I have this huge hope that actually the, the different methods of communication, Facebook, whatever, what's one, when, what's so false, they can become more meaningful if you really, if you really try, if you really start using them to, to create, to push people to move and their everyday life to do stuff. So, and, and, and I have really a lot of faith in, 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 the, in the new generation and, and as I can see my students and, and, and all these classes and, and still at six o'clock, they just come into this meeting when they just set up stuff and projects what they can do and practical stuff for people to help. So um, 
I am hoping and, and, and there that, 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 this, that this information technology is actually going to be not this, like this showcase where everything is perfect. Everything is kind of cool. Everything is very, everybody is so much like, like, oh yeah, we are all helping, but we are going to see that now that is actually a very powerful tool to really move people, to move people, but with the social responsibility of moving them towards the, the, the way which is really going to help them. So um, I, I, this is very much what, what is, what is in, in our faculty and we are working so much on, on that issue and trying to see international people coming in who they want to be part of it, really creating, creating for the people, for the people who are most in necessity. Thank you for that. But I, I'm not, I want you to follow up on this because um, uh, we, we just heard about maybe a, a vision for the future. Is that vision, we, we've heard twice or three times already in our discussion, the word empathy. Have we learned empathy from this uh, situation? And will that continue on to, uh, or shall we say post-COVID? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, empathy is an evasive concept and, you know, um, I have to be maybe a little bit skeptical, but one, one thing I think is very interesting. We haven't discussed globalization. And I think that one of the things about a global pandemic is that all of a sudden, all of us are sort of in the same boat and we all understand the constraints and, you know, the potential damage to not only to human life, but also to human rights because of the lockdowns. You know, this is a global crisis. And for us as lawyers trying to come up with ideas about how to handle a global crisis and thinking about the future, thinking about empathy, thinking about human rights, this is not a single country or a single continent which is in trouble and the other parts of the world are just running their normal life. So I do think there's a broader lesson that, that can be learned from the crisis that no country is immune to not only to natural disasters, but also to the legal measures that are being undertaken to combat this pandemic and undercut in the way human rights and human freedom. So, if all of us a year ago would have been told that we would not be able to exit our homes, not because we did anything wrong, just because there is a pandemic, we would have thought that this is probably an unrealistic. So there's a global lesson, both about human rights, about empathy and about the role of law. And this is something that I want to say about law. Law creates social order and law becomes even more necessary when the underlying social order is being undermined by a pandemic. So we need lawyers more than any point at any other point in history. And for us as legal educators, and this is again, something which is definitely very much um, uh, uh, on, on our plate because we as academics have probably a once in a lifetime opportunity to reconsider doctrines to reconsider right. our standards, to reconsider our constitutions, whether they actually you know, uh, conform, whether they actually deal with the problems that we as humans may face, that we as societies may face. So empathy, definitely so, but it's even more so about the fact that the world is a global village and many of the legal issues that typify us as humans are not only concerned with the specific legal system, but for the entire, uh, the entirety of humanity. So this is a very interesting lesson that we are learning from this pandemic. Yeah. Thank you. I, I want you to carry on with that thought, Jay, please. But I just want to say that <clears throat> like, like uh, in, in all crises, very often we see great leaders, le legal leaders come. When they speak of the fog of war, we need, when during the fog of war, we need law. You're saying now in epidemics, when we had the wars, uh, internet, um, <clears throat> well, uh, uh, real wars uh, and how people responded to them and, and uh, some leaders took advantage of these, these crises to try to suppress human rights and, and it was there very often only the courts that st stepped in. Uh, Jay, how about you? Yeah, thanks. So thanks, uh, Demundra. I mean, my, my own sense is I'm, I'm very bullish about uh, the law right now. I'm very bullish about uh, law schools and the role of lawyers mm -hmm. in, in our society. Uh, you know, I, I, I work at a, at a law school that has really uh, sought to try and promote not just the theoretical 
uh, understanding of law, but how that uh, sort of theory applies on the ground and what it means to actual everyday lawyering, what it means to everyday judging. We have a center at our law school that focuses specifically on this issue, not just in the United States, but in a comparative context, particularly in countries that are located in the global south, um, where frankly, I mean, we are seeing rule of law uh, challenges uh, occurring, but we're also seeing a great amount of uh, rights-based lawyering that's occurring. And you know, one of the reasons that I'm optimistic is I look at the data from just this year alone um, in the United States, but in also other parts uh, of the world, we're seeing you know, massive increases in uh, applications uh, by students who are interested in law. I mean, in the United States right now, uh, at this point, we have about uh, applications are right now uh, a third up from where they were last year. And so my, my own sense, uh, Goodmunder, and I know we just have a couple minutes left here, but my, my own sense is, is that, uh, you know, just given the political developments that we've been seeing here in the United States uh, over the last few years, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we're seeing a lot of rights consciousness uh, among people who are very interested in, in pursuing a legal career to correct what has been a decaying of the rule of law um, in, in, in this country, uh, but also in other parts of, of the world. And so, you know, I'm optimistic. I, I'm an optimistic person uh, generally, uh, but I'm especially optimistic now because I, I think that what we've seen is a, a lot of uh, innovation. We've seen a lot of creativity. And, you know, I think we've seen a lot of hope uh, among people who, really want to see a, a, a change from how things have been uh, happening over the last few years in particular. So um, I think having the ties uh, via globalization is going to only be that much more helpful. And, and my, my sense is, is that this should be a time of optimism, especially when we're hearing about the news of the vaccines that are forthcoming. Um, and you know, Fingers crossed, I guess that's what I would say. I, I, I think that this is a, a, a really important moment. Well, there, um, I, I thank, you for, thank you for that because I remember the last time we were together, you, you were in despair because of the, lower, the lowering of applications to, to uh, law school. And it's a, a very, it's a good, a good sign really that uh, is, the, yeah. the need is even greater and people are responding to it. And what about your experiences in, uh, in Colombia, Israel? Are you getting an increase? Is an increased interest in the law? Yeah, well, well I, I can say that we've seen a, like a 30% increase. Um, and and he, here's an interesting reason. So Israelis do a compulsory military service. But usually the thing that they do once they're done with it is to go for a year to travel either in Latin America or in Southeast Asia. And obviously because of the coronavirus, this is not possible. So we get an entire new group of people who were um, available for studies and very much interested in law. And I agree that law is, you know, it used to lose much of its flavor, but now it's all of a sudden becoming once again, interesting, challenging, and many more people who are maybe attracted to the computer sciences are now once again interested in law. So in a way, a crisis is a good time for lawyers. I'm sorry to say that, but I guess it's true. And for us as law school, we've benefited from this as well. Yeah, well, thank you. Ildiko, well, you, you were mentioning before that you see an increase in social consciousness uh, of, uh, of, of the law, but is there also an increase in interest in, in studying law? Well, uh, as you as you know, our country like uh, we we are a country of lawyers. So yeah. it's um, well, um, but I mean, I mean, really, like answering the question. Um, yes, students they do have and an increasing interest actually to study law, but these students also they take advantage of which is an interdisciplinary uh, like multidisciplinary university. More and more students. They come in and they say, you know, I would like law, but I also would like international relations. Okay, I would like economics. I would like, and actually, we have a student who is doing biology, like a double of biology. Before, 
at the law schools, normally what we were saying, you know, if you are doing law, you are already done. You are, you know, you are, you are in this. I mean, you are the one. You are the one who is going to save the world. And, and actually, we were also saying that, you know, law is so complicated. they requiring so much of your energy. Why do you do a double? And I was always the enemy of this idea. I myself was always like, you know, student, if you feel like you want to do that other thing as well, do it. But with responsibility, you know what you are doing. And if you feel that there is a problem, come back. We are going to help you how we are doing. So I can see that the new generations, they are lawyers, but much more interdisciplinary. I am very, I mean, teaching classes where actually I want to see students from other disciplines coming in. And, and when I have engineers, when I have like medical doctors coming in, I'm just like, oh yeah, I don't want to be like with, with, with lawyers, the students, it's like that, that you are like second category, not at all. But this experience and the lawyer to be this interdisciplinary person, I think, I think this is very much, this is very much the future. But for that purpose, us who are the law professors, who are, who are leaving the law schools, we have to be extremely open and we cannot pretend to be different from the others because it also comes from us. We are the lawyers and the rest of the world. So when we approach the world, then the world is going to become better and the world is going to come to us. So I think this is going to be the future and this interdisciplinary possibility for the students, they want it, but we also want to give them and we, want, and we also want to help them to be able. Well, thank you. Uh, I've, I've been responding, asking you uh, as a result of the questions we're getting from the, our audience. Uh, one one uh, I would like to address to you, Nishit, because uh, speaking about the, um, the logistics of teaching, and you, you I, know, are, are, I know your attitude towards the Bar Council in India. This is a very local situation, but maybe you can share uh, from the U.S. situation also, Matt and Jay, that we have this, we have this Bar Council, which is very much on... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, hands-on. And one of the things they insist on is that students sit in the classroom. Uh, they, there's an there's attendance uh, requirement, 70%, you know, and there are certain aspects of that. What do you think about that, Nisha? Do you think that the Bar Council may start relenting and seeing that maybe one doesn't have to spend, you know, eight, eight hours a day in the classroom for five years? I think they will have to change, okay? And so far, it was more voluntary. Now it is going to become mandatory because of the situation, right? That is my first take. Second is that, you know, the uh, way in which the university's function will have to undergo change. And let me just point out to you that uh, they will have to realize that new ways of doing things will have to be done, ethics and other kind of stuff you create. And uh, so Google, for example, recently made a huge announcement that could change the future of work and higher education. It is launching a selection of professional courses that teaches candidates how to perform on-demand jobs. And these courses are called Google Career Certificates. And they teach what you teach in four years in six months time. Okay. And they consider that that will be equivalent to a graduate degree. So a lot of new changes are coming. Bar Council would have to change because if you can't attend course, at the most they will go on for one year, two years, but ultimately they will have to agree. And what is the role of Bar Council? I think that is what they will also have to revisit. And I'm sure just as we changed court, we thought India was laggard on technology. Today, we are proud to say that the way in which the Supreme Court and other courts have begun to take over e-hearings, okay, it is releasing so much extra time for professionals. The amount of time people used to bill appearing and going and coming, now it is happening in no time. Instead of 10 hours, it used to take one hour now. And the rest of the time they function, you know. So I believe that it is, uh, it is uh, you know, it's going to save cost, it's going to save time. And I'm sure that Bar Council will not remain laggard as people think so. They will change because if the situation demands change, everybody responds to the crisis. I think my gut feel is that there will be a time, even uh, uh, you know, uh, whether as a professional firm or as a bar council or even <laughs> the role of uh, the bar associations that will become. For example, one small thing I'll just share that India did never had continuing education or mandatory MCLA was never there. But we have every single morning we have 
mandatory continuing education program from 9 to 10. Without that, we don't normally start a day unless there's something uh, unavoidable. That's a different thing. So we really also have to change. We have to go from best practice to the next practice. So together, we can create programs which will be university engagement, bar council engagement, bar association engagement, uh, law firms, bigger law firms, smaller law firms, technology provider. And last point I would also make that uh, we have in uh, uh, we have uh, included engineers, electronics engineers, PhD in artificial intelligence, medical doctors, and persuaded them to change to legal career. So we have a number of lawyers who have engineering background, medical background, uh, uh, and those kind of things, as I mentioned, uh, because we'll have to become all inclusive. I think it was very well uh, said a little while ago that now we cannot think in isolation from other profession. And we become more creative, more innovative when we have interplay of different disciplines coming together. I think this is I called, think, I, you know, I, think, my... I thank you for this because this is actually where we began, wasn't it? We're talking about the, the need for collaboration. Is, is that we've always known this, but it's now been brought very much to the fore and the immediacy of it. We don't have time. We, we, we can't have the long term process like you have in the bar council and, and bar associations. We have to act, uh, react immediately. And I've heard the uh, J and the uh, no, 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 right? in four months instead of nine months or ten months, right? Wow. So I think you get the same degree. So yeah. I think that we'll have to repurpose university and see what is the role of a university. Let us start with that proposition. We can have one discussion. And then in light of that, we can do it. Is the role to teach simply classroom? That will be an outdated thing that will be done virtual. But to change the world for the better, that is the role. Yeah. How do you, because- I, I, I like, I'm I, like sorry. I think that the four of you, uh, we, the, the, we, the question I was gonna ask at the end, Dev, everyone, you, you, most of you already answered it by saying that you are positive, bullish, uh, we heard uh, Jay say, uh, we see in social engagement, we see uh, that the people will be more empathetic towards each other. But I have a specific question to you, Matt, and you can add to the, your co comments about the future in, in concluding also. I was asked to ask you about the role of cultural exchange. And I think it may be inspired because you mentioned the, 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 the uh, intern from Hawaii and the one from New York. What about the, the need for people to be with each other about different cultures uh, interacting in, in, in your environment? And that is one of the things I am concerned about that we will lose in the virtual world. I mean, the virtual world of law is here to stay. There's no question that we're going to be so, do so much remotely. But the experience I would have looked forward to having, let's say, OP Jindal law students coming to New York and spending time not just partaking in the legal process what happens in my courtroom, but being part of the whole social milieu of what makes New York City what it is, that's what I'm afraid will lack. The same way I'm just thinking that's good mother, when was it last uh, February, March? My wife and I were with you on the OP Jindal campus and yeah, as yeah. good as this is, as great as this is, communicating with everybody here, it's not the same. It's like, yeah. I don't really to have gotten the flavor of what life is like at an Indian law school, what life is like in New Delhi, what life is like in India in general, you really have to be there. That, and that's the part that I, that, that's gonna be the big challenge. Can we, repl can we replicate that? Can we, in our, in our new virtual system, are we gonna still have the rituals and traditions and norms that make the legal community what it is? But also, are we gonna have the opportunity to really to travel somewhere to be actually in the places, in the courthouses, in the law schools, in the universities, in the cities where all and the towns where all this takes place. Is this going to be the same? And what are we going to be lacking? So I am bullish on this because it's there's so many good things that come out of this virtual, but I am also have some misgivings and some concerns. And that's uh, are we gonna be able to replicate that experience where you have cultures, cultural exchanges by actually going to another place and having people from other places being there with you? Well, thank you for that. It's a very good way to close off. And, and <clears throat> I just, we, we, we will be closing for one sentence uh, in one second, but the, I want to thank you all, but I cannot help it, <clears throat> but um, 
relate an experience after hearing what El, El Dico said, that which I have in Costa Rica. So I lived in Costa Rica. I, I went there, and I was serving as a judge in the well, in the Law of the Sea Tribunal, and I had certain problems with um, uh, immunity in 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 the in Costa Rica, and we went through the legal process at a certain stage. And finally, the, the a good friend of mine, who was the Secretary General of the of the Ministry, said, "Listen, we're gonna I, I'm gonna disconnect the lawyers from this. We're just gonna do it." He said, and then and he said, "You know." I'm a great believer of the, I'm a great um, admirer of Gulliver's Travels, but he, but I, he, there's one chapter which he hasn't written, and I'm going to write that for uh, when Gulliver traveled to a, a country created by lawyers. That's missing from the book. But I think that's, a, you know, all of us, we, you know, we, I think we've gone through in the afternoon, in this uh, short time, the pros and cons of our profession, but I think we all stand up to be proud of what we can do. Uh, and, and what and what hopefully we, we 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 will do, and thank you all of the all of you for coming, uh, and we'll just turn this back to the remainder of the of the conference. Until the next time, and be safe, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. And I, I you talked about culture. Look at film uh, Netflix uh, thing called Emily. We thought that it was all Western culture, but now we see what is the difference between Chicago culture and Paris culture. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And we'll always, well, we're going to all be connected by Netflix. It's the one constant in the, <laughs> globally now. So. <laughs> oh wonderful. Thank you. We are wonderful to see you all. I'm grateful for... Thank you very much. It's beautiful to much, meet you. Uh, fascinating panel. Thank you, Nishit. Thank you, uh, Matthew and Jay and uh, Itziko and Professor Goodwinder for moderating the panel. Uh, I mean, what an extraordinary diversified set of views all of you have shared. I deeply appreciate your time and uh, thank you. <laughs>